Hey guys, it's Bread God Gaming. Hope you're having a good day. This is my beginner guide to warfare in Crusader Kings 3. These are the topics we're going to cover today. Feel free to skip around as you see fit. Waging war in Crusader Kings 3 requires a Cassus Belli, which basically means reason for war. Without a valid reason, we cannot wage war. The game will even tell us we have no Cassus Belli available. You also can't wage war while in debt. I'll review Cassus Belli in more detail later on. For now, I'll use a Claim War Cassus Belli for my overview. For any Cassus Belli, they will have requirements, costs, and different victory peace, and defeat outcomes. The requirement for a claim war is that either we have a claim, or a vassal, courtier, or a guest has a claim. And claims can be found in the middle of the characters page, down here. Or in other tabs, like the courtier tab, it might show up next to the characters icon like this. You can see this guy has two claims here. So in this example, I have a claim on the County of Mon, which is located over here. And so if I click on the King of Alba, you'll see if I right click him, I can declare war. The reason for war is showing up here as our claim. Declaring this claim war is going to cost me 75 prestige. We can preview what's going to happen if we win, if we white peace, or if we surrender this war. If we expand this arrow, you'll see that if I surrender this war or lose the war, I will lose my claim and I'll even pay the King of Scotland this amount of gold and some other effects. If I white piece the war, you'll see that I'll keep my claim and I'll lose some prestige. And if I win this war and enforce the demand, you'll see that it says I get the County of Mon here and some other effects here. If I scroll down though, you'll see that actually I don't directly get it. The Duke of Mon will become my vassal. So sometimes you won't personally own the land, but instead have a new vassal. Up here, the bar will approximate who the game thinks will win. We can preview the number and types of troops each side has. We can see how much gold each side has saved. And we can preview how many allies each side has. Even though the game thinks I'm at a disadvantage, I have so much gold that I can easily hire mercenaries and be two times stronger. We'll discuss strategy when we've gotten through some more mechanics, and I can explain how I know I should win this war. So when we declare this war, a banner at the bottom right will pop up, and you'll see that the castle Belli is going to pop up here, which says that it is the Irish claim on the Earldom of Mon. You'll see that our lands are highlighted in blue, and the enemy's lands are highlighted in red, and our allies' lands, which is the Queen of Denmark here, are also highlighted in blue, and likewise his ally is also highlighted in red. This striped blue area means that this is the war target, which in our case is this county of Mon. If there was no specific war target, then by default the enemy capital will be the war target. Below our character's names is a total soldier count, and if we hover over the numbers with our mouse, you'll be able to see a breakdown of the exact types of troops each side has. In the middle here, you can see the options that we've discussed of surrendering, white peace, and enforce demand. In order to actually enforce demands, we need our war score to be plus 100%. In order to white peace, we need plus 30%. And we can surrender voluntarily at any point or the enemy can force us to surrender if we have minus 100% score. The war score is made up of different values. The check mark icon here is for completely holding the objectives, which is the war target. And if the war target was something bigger, like a duchy, then you have to completely control it in order to gain the objective war score. After three months of completely holding the war target, you will gain 1% score per month. The opposite is also true where the defender will gain war score for every month we don't control the target. This score persists even when control is switched between sides, so losing it can suddenly bring about a big swing in score. Objective score has no limit, so you can control half of the enemy's lands and still be negative war score. So a common mistake is to forget about the war target for too long. The second score here is for battles and sums up all the wins and losses. The max score one can get from battles is capped at 50% for attackers and 100% for defenders, except in a crusade where the cap is 100% for both attackers and defenders. The amount of war score gained in a battle is proportionate to the casualties inflicted, also capped at 50% if you wipe out the entire enemy army. For example, in this war, my enemy has 2019 total troops, and in this slaughter at Tandbridge, I wiped out 1,067 of his troops. 
and I gained 26% battle score. This is because I wiped out 53% of his total army, and 53% of the max 50% battle score means 26% in the end. The third score here is for occupied holdings, and the limit is 150% for both attackers and defenders. The amount of score gained is relative to the total amount of land the enemy realm has, and is partially based on the development of the county. If the enemy has only a few counties to their realm, then each piece will be worth a big percentage, versus a large kingdom, it might be only a few percent. The fourth is for important prisoners of war, or for bonus for holding the capital of the enemy realm. A special rule with capturing the enemy ruler is that you will instantly have plus 100% war score, and can enforce demands immediately. Even if the enemy has besieged all your lands and won all the battles, and mathematically you're at something greater than minus 100% score, capturing the enemy leader means instant victory. Likewise, don't get captured or you will instantly lose the war. So now that we have an overview of how war score is calculated, let's overview the military tab. Our total army count is listed up here. Our army consists of levies, which are weak peasants that deal 10 damage and have 10 toughness. They have zero pursuit, and zero screen. We'll go over what the stats mean later when we talk about battles. Over here we also have our powerful knights who are either our courtiers or our vassals. Their prowess skill is going to determine their fighting power with their damage stat being 100 times their prowess and their toughness being 10 times their prowess. So our knight Stanar here will have 2200 damage and 220 toughness which as you can see is already a lot compared to a peasant levy. Down here are the men at arms. These are the trained soldiers that we pay on a monthly basis to serve us. We can see their stats are much better than peasants. The unraised maintenance is how much we pay per month when they are not summoned, and the full maintenance is when they are summoned for war. A special note for tribal rulers is they pay this monthly men at arms cost with prestige instead of gold, which is more quickly gained in the beginning, and therefore tribal realms can be stronger in the beginning. So if you're having trouble with army strength, consider the 867 start date for a tribal ruler. We can increase or decrease the size of the regiments, with the default unit strength being 100 in a regiment. Some units like knights or elephants have smaller regiment sizes of 50 or 25. This X button here will destroy this regiment if you can't afford them or would like to swap them out for a different type. Just note you can't undo this. These arrows here are to station your regiment at your personally held counties. The regiment will gain bonuses based on the buildings in the county. So in this example they're stationed in trolley and because they're stationed in trolley you'll see that they get plus one damage from the Mott, which is this castle type, and also plus 1.6 toughness, also from the Mott. There are even some buildings that we could build, such as the militia camps, which will increase the skirmisher's damage and pursuit by 20%. And you can see that as the levels increase, that bonus is going to increase by a lot. This is also why late game, a fully developed feudal realm will have stronger men at arms than a tribal county, since tribal rulers don't have access to these powerful buildings. If you don't have enough counties, then you won't be able to station all your men-at-arms. In this example, I luckily can. The men-at-arms can also have terrain advantages or disadvantages, modifying their stats, and they will also counter other types of men-at-arms. We'll go over counters when we get to battles. Each ruler has a limit on the regiments of men-at-arms they can retain, which you can hover over here for a breakdown. We can create new regiments with this button here from a base set of types, along with any men-at-arms that might be unlocked by cultural traditions or technology. Siege weapons are different than other men-at-arms as they provide only siege progress and no actual damage. We'll see an example of what this means once we talk about siege. We can get a preview of the total costs of our army down here. This first number over here shows us the total cost of our unraised men-at-arms that we're paying them to maintain every month. The cost down here is for if we raise all of our peasant levies and all of our men at arms but if for longer than five years and so when we raise our army we'll see our army cost is 10.7 per month we can also see a breakdown of the gold cost by hovering over our income you'll see that we pay a little extra in the red because our martial skill is not that good if we look at our martial we only have six so we have a penalty of two percent this cost can also be decreased by discounts like having a better martial skill putting your martial to the organized army task and being tribal the checked box down here is to automatically reinforce your 
your damage regiments if you can afford the gold or prestige cost. 99% of the time I have this checked, so just leave it alone. This section here is for military rally points. A rally point is where your army can be raised, and the first one is defaulted to your capital county. We can use this arrow button to move this rally point to anywhere in our realm. The raise all here button will summon both peasants and men at arms into this county. It will also tell you how many days it will take to raise them. The other button here is to raise only our men at arms. Sometimes you don't need all your troops so you can save some gold by raising just your elites. You'll see that raising just the men at arms is 4.4 gold a month versus everyone is going to cost 7.6. And this third button here, the raise local army button, will only raise the armies that are closest to this particular rally point. The game will even remind you that if you only have one rally point, then this button acts the same as raise all here. This button is usually used if your realm is very large and you only need a small local army for a fight on the outskirts. For example, if I use this arrow here to add another rally point, let's put it all the way on the other side. Then if I click on this rally point, you'll see that the local army is 1725 peasants versus over here in this rally point, it's 862. These numbers are collected from the counties nearby this rally point. Just note that when you click raise local army, it summons the peasants but also the men at arms in that area so if you need your elites in one area you can click on a rally point and hit the raise men at arms button versus the other one now you can hit local army and it'll summon these 1725 peasants here so the peasants are here and the men at arms are here on the left at any point we're raising the army we can decide to stop gathering by clicking this x button if we feel we have enough numbers so we can save on cost, we can even use this disband button to send home our armies. Just be careful when disbanding while at war, since you'll have a time delay penalty when raising new troops. These triangle symbols that are over here and on your army and in other areas just simply show how much of your army is men in arms. And if your army consists more of men in arms, then the quality overall is more elite. The quality actually has no effect on actual war. Warfare. For our raised army, to the left here is the commander of the army. The most important aspect of a commander is their advantage modifier, which boosts our damage, and I'll go over damage later. If the character has any commander traits, then they will pop up to the side as well, and they will modify the effectiveness of this stack of troops. We can use the arrows down here to select the new commander. You'll see that they are automatically sorted by commander skill, which is based on different things like your martial skill. Some commanders will have this helmet icon, meaning that they serve as a knight in your army. If you make them a commander, then you actually remove them from your army. Sometimes when picking between commanders, you might want to leave them as a knight in your army army instead of as a commander if they have very high prowess. If we scroll down here you'll see that you can also command your own troops. It's going to be based on the martial skill and you get a plus five bonus for leading your own troops. You do risk getting wounded if you lead your troops however, so unless you are the best option I will leave someone else to command it. In the middle here you can see which troops make up this army. This blue bar up here represents the percent of troops compared to the max available. Your troops will replenish if there's enough supply which I'll go over soon or if they are unraised then they will automatically replenish as long as you have monthly reinforcement checked off. Let me review the buttons down here. This chain button is for attaching your army to another army. The AI sometimes uses this to follow your army around and vice versa if you want to send help to an ally but can't pay attention to the war you can use this to just help the ally automatically. The next button is to split off specific regiments into a new army. Unfortunately you can't split it further down than this however you can put individual knights into the armies and this is a strategy to send your unwanted sons into battle alone. The next button here will split the current stack into two. This next button here is to split off hired soldiers like mercenaries and on the map you'll see that they'll be represented by this helmet and sword icon here. And the last button is the disband army button. You can use your mouse to select all the armies in one area. And at the top here, you can merge them into one. You can even reorganize the armies and split the composition as you desire. This is also another way to gauge how much gold you want to spend on troops. 
and once you've formed the army you can disband it to save gold so coming to the top right here is the army supply by default the supply is out of 100 units and can be increased by perks your soldiers will use these held supplies if there are not enough supplies from the barony they are in we can see the supply limit of the barony here and by hovering over the barony itself if the supply limit of the tile your army is sitting on is high enough then your troops will increase supply modified by certain bonuses and it will also replenish damaged troops every month however if the number of troops is over the supply limit then they will use your supplies over time and your troops will not recover as your supply decreases you'll suffer an advantage penalty and eventually monthly attrition you can split your army up into smaller units and move into different counties so they keep under the limit this skull represents the monthly attrition and attrition is the monthly troops that your army will lose per month when you siege or loot a holding there is one percent attrition per month if you are at zero supplies there is a five percent attrition these two can stack to six percent if you're sieging with a starving army. Another form of attrition is caused by moving your armies around in hostile areas, not bordered by allied or neutral areas. If a move would cause attrition, the game will have this red skull preview how many casualties you take, which is 5% or 100 troops. However, if I slowly conquer the territories from the outside, then I will not take attrition. Alternatively, I can sometimes use smart positioning to prevent attrition. So in this example, I'm the Holy Roman Empire on the right and I'm attacking the Kingdom of France on the left. And let's say my army stack is here, and I want to attack this army stack that is over here. My guys could run across this land here, but you'll see I'll take attrition over here. However, I also control some areas up here that I've sieged before. What I could do is I could click on one of them here, and you'll see I don't take attrition. I could then hold down the shift button, and then as I right click, it will queue up the moves, and I'll be able to get there without walking straight across and causing that attrition. So you can use shift and right click in order to move in certain areas to avoid the moving attrition. To get mercenaries, we come to the mercenary tab here. We can see a preview of the number of troops and types of troops you get here. It will also show an icon of the specific men and arms you'll get so that if you need to buy specific counters, you can do that. When you hire a group of mercenaries, it'll be for a three year contract. And if you've hired a group of mercenaries already you can extend your contract for more gold the number of mercenary bands available is modified by the size of your culture so you might have few bands if you've established a new culture aside from being extra troops mercenaries are extremely useful because they can be summoned instantly by clicking the raise button in the mercenary band you've hired you'll see it instantly summons here in my capital versus normally i would have to raise all and it would take a few days so in this example i have a battle here that i might lose and I have a lot of gold saved up. What I could do is I can have my rally point get as close as I can. So I could put it maybe over here. You just don't want it to be on the actual barony that the battle's on. And then I can go into the mercenaries and I can hire a stack and it will automatically appear here instantly. And I can hire as many as I think I might need. So let's get a few. And then I can immediately send these troops into battle to assist. And that's why mercenaries are super useful to instantly summon reinforcements when it's fighting near your own lands. Just make sure the rally point is in a green area, otherwise they'll be summoned to your capital. You can also go into debt to hire mercenaries. The limit is 24 times your monthly income. So in this example, we have five gold left, but we do have 87.1 monthly income. Going by the 24 times rule, that means we have 2,090 gold that we could borrow from. So you'll see that even though I have only five gold, I can actually hire this mercenary band for 278 gold. You'll see I'm going to go into a little bit of debt and I can keep hiring up to that limit. So another one, so another one, here's another one, and that's our limit. We can't hire more than that. So you'll see that these armies are now back here in my service and they will serve me for three years. So in desperate times, I can hire extra mercenaries if needed. Just be careful since we're in debt, we'll get some penalties, but if it helps us survive a crisis, then by all means use the debt. Holy orders are another type of hired forces, but you spend piety to hire them instead of gold. They are only created via the found holy order decision, 
and when you found it, you'll become the order's patron. You can also change the headquarters of the order, and you can have it in any held county, and the HQ will be in a city of one of your held counties. If you lose the county where your headquarters is, then you also lose patronage of the order, and the enemy could destroy the order. Similarly, if you take over a county title with the headquarters city inside of it, you can also take over patronage of that order if you're the same faith. When the holy order is created, it's going to start off a little bit weak. However, over time, it can increase in strength. You can see up here that we are the patron and that the headquarters is in the city title inside of Dublin. As patron, we can also hire this holy order for free. We can only hire one order at a time and can only be used to fight against someone of a hostile or evil faith. Some additional benefits as patron include you can try to send your son into the Holy Order as long as they have a martial education trait. This will give them a Order member trait and they will be removed from succession. Second, you can borrow gold from a Holy Order if they have the gold, but will have to repay them eventually. Don't forget to factor in Holy Orders when declaring war on certain religions, especially on Catholicism as it tends to have a lot of holy orders. In this example, I'm the emir of the Hamadid Emirate, and I'm trying to declare war on the ruler of Cagliari. Although the war estimator says that my allies and I should be much stronger than the enemy, you'll see that once we declare war, he's going to be able to hire holy order. And you see the enemy has now hired a holy order. And now you can see that the tables have drastically turned, and they have a much larger army. And the last type of army is special soldiers, which you get for playing certain historical characters, or for completing decisions. In this example, I'm William the Bastard of Normandy, and you'll see that I have many of these special soldiers. They kind of act like mercenaries where I can instantly raise them. By hitting the raise button over here, you can see they are being raised. Their banner is also going to be this silver color, versus if I raise my other armies, you'll see that my normal armies are a red banner color. There are some special rules for these soldiers. One thing is that they can be either inherited upon succession or will stand down upon succession. You can see we have some troops that will be inherited by our successor versus most of the troops will actually stand down once we die. These soldiers also do not reinforce unlike your regular army so use them smartly. Some special soldiers don't use supply. You'll see that William's troops do but you can see Genghis Khan's troops do not. And that's everything for the military tab and interface. Let's deep dive into battles and sieges. First, there is a color code for armies on the map, with green being your armies, gray meaning neutral armies, red meaning enemy armies, blue being ally army, and orange being hostile armies. Hostile armies can be raiders, or they can be other armies attacking the same enemy. So in this example, we are attacking the King of Alba, and if we click on this army over here, you'll see that he is also attacking the King of Alba. So if I were to take over the Kingdom of Alba, then his war will be be redirected towards me since I would be the new owner of Alba and therefore rulers that can get in the way of your objectives are going to be hostile to you but not necessarily your direct enemy. We can do battle with hostile armies however they will not contribute to the war score. To start a battle our armies need to land in the same barony as either hostile or enemy armies. If a battle is about to occur there will be this preview icon underneath here and it will give a prediction of the outcome as well as when it will occur. If you don't see this icon that means a battle will not occur. In this example I'm stationed in this barony and I want to chase down this enemy army. If I right click it you'll see that no icon is going to appear and that means that my timing is not correct so you'll see that by the time I get to that barony he's already over here and I can right click to continue chasing him. You'll see that this icon is now appearing here meaning that I should be able to capture him in time and you can see that we do indeed capture him. The prediction system is overall okay, and when you hover over it, it will list out the factors that are in your favor and against your favor. We'll be going over these factors soon. Anytime you're going into a battle, you always want to have a commander. If you have no commander, then your chance of winning can change drastically. When a battle happens, we get this interface. At the top here is a bar that will show the overall strength between the two sides. And as the battle goes on, it will swing in the direction of the victor. You can also see that there is something called combat width over here, which is how many troops can fight in this battleground. By default, it is the average of the two armies and is modifiable by the terrain. 
for example, mountains will decrease the width by 50%. This means that the more elite your army is, the better your damage will be per space you have in this combat width. So use this to your advantage, like defending in a mountain. On each opposing side, we can see the commanders and their base advantage, and any commander traits will be shown below. In the middle here, it tells us which phase of combat we are in, and also what the advantage difference is. For every one advantage difference, that army will get a 2% damage increase. So the enemy has 6 advantage in their favor, and their damage is now increased by 12%. Aside from the commander's base advantage, here's some other sources of advantage. You can see that location, circumstances, and terrain can affect advantage greatly, so try to use the terrain to your advantage. It might be hard to identify if you're crossing a river or not, but the battle preview icon will let you know if you are indeed crossing a river, so use that information to modify your strategy. A common mistake is to go straight from sea to battle. You can see from this table it will give you a minus 30 advantage. Instead, you can land your army on nearby land and wait for the debuff to expire in 30 days. The days that you are moving also count towards this timer if you are crunched for time. Coming back to the UI, the area above the advantage difference will show you which phase of the battle we are in. I'll give a high level overview of the four combat phases. In the maneuver phase, commanders roll an advantage bonus and they continue to reroll this bonus as the battle rages on. In the early battle phase, the armies fight and can't retreat. If enough damage is dealt to the enemy, then a stack wipe occurs and everyone is killed. If not enough damage was dealt, then we go into the late battle phase and the armies keep fighting. In this phase, you can also order your troops to retreat. The last phase is the aftermath phase where survivors attempt to run away and they are damaged with the pursuit stat and the amount of damage is decreased by the screen stat. If enough survivors make it out, they will form an uncontrollable stack that will move to a random location. The only points we need to remember for combat phases is that damage is the most important stat and that if you need to retreat, Remember that you can do it in the late battle phase. So as time passes, you'll see that the battle phase is going to change. And here I am in the late battle phase. If I want to retreat, then I can click on this battle and then I can right click anywhere else and you'll see that my army is going to start retreating. So my army in green here is retreating and my allies are continuing to fight over here. I can always run back into the battle if I need to as well. And so you see we defeated the enemy and we also got lucky and captured their war leader. So the way damage is dealt in this game, in this example we'll use 100 peasant levy. So they have a strength of 100 men and they will each do 10 damage for a total of 1000 damage. The game has a 0 0.03 casualty rate so for this total damage we multiply it by 0 0.03 and this calculates how many casualties will be inflicted which is 30. Then we divide this casualty number by the enemy toughness, which if we're fighting enemy peasant levies would be 10 toughness. So our 100 strength regiment of peasant levies will kill three enemy peasants. If they were fighting armored footmen, then the 30 damage will be divided by the 22 toughness and the peasants will only kill 1.36 enemy armored footmen. Another key difference is that the armored footmen and other men at arms can be buffed by buildings. You can also see that a 10 prowess knight will deal just as much damage as 100 peasants. So in the early game, having good knights and men at arms is most important. And you don't have to remember how damage is calculated. Just know that it's most important to stack as much damage as you can in your armies. Coming back to the UI, so for counters, you'll see the types of men at arms in your army down here. And if you hover over your men at arm, It'll tell you what it's doing in terms of countering. You can see that our light footmen are countering the enemy's armored footmen. And if we hover over the enemy's armored footmen, you'll see that they are being countered by our light footmen. And you can see that they only deal 64% of their damage instead of 100%. Also make note that they only have one regiment of armored footmen versus we have two regiments of light footmen. And then amount of damage reduction depends on how many regiments are on each side countering each other. So if we look at our bowmen here, you can see we have three regiments and they are countering the enemy's light footmen which if we hover over their light footmen you can see they only have one regiment and you can see their damage is being reduced drastically to only 10 percent so having counters can drastically affect the damage that the enemy's troops can deal however it's also true that if you have enough of one type of men at arm then even if they are being countered as long as the number of regiments you have is way greater than the enemy's counter, your damage will not be reduced by much at all. So once the battle is over, you'll see that the enemy's surviving troops are running away, and we have a battle overview at the top here. You'll see each side's starting army count, the amount of casualties they had, and then their remaining survivors. 
We can see even more details of how many kills and losses each type of regiment had. You'll see that our knights killed the most, then our peasants, who suffered heavy losses, and then our other men in arms contributed here too. You can break it down by the phases, and you'll see most of the casualties are in the main phase, and only some of them are in the pursuit phase. You can also see how many kills each knight on either side inflicted. You'll see again that the knights have a lot of kills. You'll also be able to see who was killed in battle. In addition to death, the knights can also be captured. You'll see we got a notification that we captured one of the enemy knights. Knights can be captured at a base of 10% or killed at a base of 5%. This can be increased to 55.3% and 27.6% if the battle was ended in the early battle phase. Basically, if you overwhelmed the enemy and had way more damage, then you might not only kill all their troops, but have a way higher chance of killing or capturing their enemy knight. Commanders can also be captured. The base chance is 10% and it's determined by an escape and capture score starting at 90 and 10 respectively. These scores can be modified by these factors. So let's just say our commander has the brave trait, then our escape score will be 90 and our capture score will be 20. That means that our chance to escape is actually 82% versus our capture rate is actually 18%. So more things to be mindful of if you are commanding your own armies. The best target to capture is the enemy war leader, which will instantly win your war. You can only capture them in battle if they are commanding their own army. You can also quickly find where they are if you click on their character portrait. It will move your camera to where they are located. Another example would be if I click on the King of England, then I click on him again, you'll see it hovers me over to his capital. Another thing to be mindful of is if your heir is serving as a knight. So you can see my heir is currently serving as a knight. That means that he could have a chance to be captured or killed. I could go over to my knight tab and go down and look for him. You can see he's over here. You can see there's an option to forbid him from being a knight. This will keep him safe from dying. So I recommend doing that to the primary heir. Conversely, if you had extra sons you disliked, again, you can send them off into battle hoping they will die. Next, we'll talk about sieges. To start a siege, we bring our troops into an enemy's county. You can only siege their castle holding. So I can have the siege start here versus if I go to their city over here. You'll see I do not siege it, so make sure you are going into their castles. In the siege UI at the top here is a bar showing the siege progress and will let us know how many days it takes to take over this castle. The siege progress needed is 100 plus 75 times the fort level, which is modified by other buildings and perks. You can check on the fort level by clicking on the county and you'll see that the fort level here is 4. Coming to the middle here. We can see the number of soldiers besieging, which is our army, and also the garrison that is defending against our siege. The besieging army needs to be greater than the garrison, otherwise the siege will not continue. The besieging army also takes attrition monthly. You can see we're taking 33 casualties per month, so your army has to also outlast the siege progress. The more troops you have, you'll also have a small bonus to the siege progress, 0.14 over here. The garrison of the county is also checked by looking in the county itself. You can see it's 550 over here. This garrison number is modified by the castle level and also some other buildings that you can build. Your martial counselor can also be on the organized army task and this will increase the garrison size of all of your holdings. The total amount of daily siege progress is shown at the bottom left here and you can see siege weapons contribute a big amount. In this siege I only have one regiment of 10 siege weapons. In this other example I have 47 siege weapons. You can see my daily progress is significantly higher. So having siege weapons is very important and especially more so if the fort level and siege progress needed is very high, otherwise the siege will take forever. Over to the right are the siege events, which automatically fire every 20 days. They will just give bonuses to the siege progress and make it go a little faster. And if you have siege weapons, it will damage the walls. If you damage the walls enough, this assault four button will appear here, and you can also preview it on the map by seeing this ladder icon show up. If you click on the assault four button, or you can press the F key, you'll see that if you assault the fort, your siege progress will increase by a lot, but you will also suffer a lot of casualties every day and not just every month so it can rapidly deplete your troops. So currently we're at 52 days left but if I assault the fort it will only take 17 days and you'll see if I pass the time my troop count will rapidly deplete versus if I stop assaulting it you'll see that I don't really deplete anything. So I usually use the assault four button if I'm really in a rush or if I have an overwhelming amount of troops. Just be careful because you lose so many soldiers from assaulting the fort. You'll see if I pass two days I've 
now captured this area. Now that I control this county, you'll see that it says it's occupied by me. And because I occupy it, if I check my soldier supplies, you'll see that they can now start to replenish. Our holding war score also increased because we controlled this county by 10.9%. You'll see we also got notifications that we took some prisoners. So characters can be captured during sieges at a 35% base chance, which is reduced by the character's intrigue and prowess to a maximum of 20% at 20 intrigue and 15% at 30 prowess. So if they have both 20 intrigue and 30 prowess, then their capture chance is zero. The only characters that get captured are desirable characters, otherwise they are killed. A desirable character is if they their spouse or close family is landed, if they have a parent, or if they have high skills, a special stat like Physician. Once we've captured them, if they are a special prisoner, it will show up as a prisoner score. Otherwise, if they are not special prisoners, we can right click them to either ransom them for gold, or I can negotiate their release and recruit them into my army as a knight. Sometimes you also want to recruit them because they have a nice claim that you can use. You also see that there is a Siege 1 notification and that that we actually got some gold from occupying that county. That pertains to this loot amount that we saw back here on the siege UI. And my last tip about sieges is that when your army is starting to siege a holding, you'll get a new button in the army UI. It'll be this button that it says Station Besiegers. What this button does is it splits off enough soldiers that will actually be able to finish off this holding. So you can see when I click that button, I have a stack of 998 soldiers. And if I click on this holding, you'll see that the garrison only has 550. And so the game has already calculated that these 998 soldiers, which will always include your siege weapons, is enough to take out this holding by itself. So I could take my main forces here, which is already selected. I can either go to a secondary holding or I can go back and fight the enemy army over here which is what I'm going to do. And you'll see when I get off of this holding, this siege is still in progress and it's due to finish in 41 days with this besieging army. And this army can now freely go and either defeat the enemy over here or I could even go to Karak here and take out a second holding just to speed up this war. If I feel like my forces are strong enough, I could even send half of them to attack. I can shuffle around the numbers as needed as well. So I need to first click on the county to make sure they're standing still. Now I can split this army in half again and I can send these troops to attack along with the other 2,000 men and these 1,500 men I'm going to send up here. So you see with the numbers advantage, I'm going to be able to attack and defend, making our wars go by a lot quicker. And these men are going to take a little longer to siege because they don't have siege weapons versus the 980 men here have 160 siege weapons behind them. So once they finish here in 18 days, I'm going to send them up, help the brothers up here. You'll see that just getting down Galloway, you'll see that just taking the war target Galloway only gave us barely 11% war score and the war has been going on for five months already so these wars can last for a few years and to speed that up you can use the station besieger and also splitting off your armies to make it go by faster by now you have a basic understanding of armies battles and sieges so here's a simple game plan for military progress always have at least one siege men at arms if you're tribal or don't have access to them you can always make up for it by going down the martial lifestyle to get the sappers perk this will give most of your men at arms some siege progress without good siege progress ability your wars will take longer especially in developed feudal lands with high fort levels if your wars take too long you might not be able to complete your dreams before your character dies a general strategy to forming your men at arms composition is to use only armored footmen also known as heavy infantry as we learned from battles damage is the most important stat and heavy infantry overall have the best stats and no disadvantages if you have any cultural men-at-arms, then you can use those as they are usually better. In this case, we are the Anglo-Saxon culture with herds and can recruit Huskerls. And the Huskerls not only have better stats, but they also get terrain bonuses. And Taiga and Forest terrain appears pretty frequently throughout our realm. A mixed army might be fine early game, but will fall off against the stronger army later. From mid to late game, you'll be using buildings to boost the damage of your men-at-arms, such as the barracks to boost the heavy infantry damage by up to 160%. Also in the mid game, there is the advanced bow making innovation, which will unlock crossbowmen, which are also very powerful and damage effective. They also unlock the shooting ranges, which is an excellent building to not only boost their own damage, but gives you a lot of tax. Don't forget about changing commanders as 
Different traits can help out in different situations. And lastly, remember your council. Your marshal has some good tasks to help strengthen your army. You can also put your spouse on the chivalry focus to give you extra marshal. And the marshal stat will give you some extra toughness and better gold maintenance. Now we'll talk about what happens when we are ready to end a war. Once I've achieved plus 100% war score, I am now able to enforce my demands. Up here in the UI is an option to demand a hostage. Although the UI is still a little bit glitchy, I'll be able to demand his daughter. I can get the county, and if I scroll down, his daughter is going to travel to be my hostage. And here's her character page showing that she's at our court in Dublin, and that she is a hostage with this little caged symbol here. At any point, if you wanted to, you could return the hostage by right-clicking her and going up here. We can also earn prestige, piety, or renown, depending on the quality of the hostage. So you see I can have six hostages and the first one would give me 0.5 piety and each one thereafter is going to be giving me less and less piety. The game soft caps you beyond five hostages. You'll get a minus 95% penalty for having more than five. Versus for renown, I'm only earning for four hostages and not all six because some of them are not prestigious enough, usually if they are a child of a king or emperor. When a realm has a hostage, that child's ruler's parent is incentivized not to attack you. If they do decide to attack, you'll see that the attacker will spend 250 prestige, lose a level of fame, gain a attacked warden debuff for 5 years, which gives them a lot of penalty. You also lose a lot of opinion with a lot of people. The AI is usually inclined not to attack you when you have a hostage, so grabbing a hostage can be useful in preventing an attacker or to gain that renown that is pretty hard to get. However, the penalty for hostages is also reversed if you attack someone one whose hostage you are holding. So if you plan to attack that ruler, then I recommend to not grab their hostage or you can return the hostage as you need. In addition, when someone does declare war against the warden, then that warden has a choice to kill the hostage or to let him off. In the current situation tab, if there are interactions with hostages, you can try to demand or recall a hostage if possible. You can also right click a nearby ruler to demand a hostage and it will highlight reasons why you can or can't demand a hostage from them. The hostages will grow up in their warden's court, and you can even educate them. Once the child turns 16, you can either send them home, or you can force them to stay a little bit longer. If you force them to stay a little bit longer, you can then imprison them, and if you're successful, now that they are your prisoner, you can negotiate their release and you can forcibly recruit them. Now that you've recruited them, you can have access to their nice claims and if possible, you can vassalize them to your empire. So it can be a nice way to get big claims. So that's all about hostages and let me talk a bit more about ending wars. After you end any war through either victory, white peace, or defeat, there will be a mutual truce signed for five years. You'll see that I've won against the King of Alba. And if I right click him, the declare war will have this reminder saying I will break the truce. To check what kind of truces we have, if you click on your character and you click on diplomacy, you'll see that we scroll down and that it says we have a truce with the King of Alba here and it's going to last for five years. You can see that if we try to declare war, it will warn us that declaring war will break the truce. And if we continue to do so anyways, you'll see that it will also penalize us. You'll see that we'll lose some prestige a level of fame and have minus 50 opinion through the broke truce modifier for three years. This is a very big opinion penalty and can be deadly to realm management, so I would usually not attack through a truce. One way to get around this is you can murder the current king, and since your truce is with the current king and not his successor, you can immediately go to war with his successor. Let's go over alliances in this game. We can negotiate alliances with close family members who are rulers. So my son here is a ruler. I can right click him and I can come and negotiate an alliance. And because of these reasons, he's going to accept. Most alliances are going to be through blood relations. So either because they are family or because we are married into each other's family. So if I click on my son, he is unmarried and I can click on find a spouse. And if the marriage will result in an alliance, you'll see the realm's coat of arms here. Otherwise, if we come down here, you'll see that marriages with these spouses will result in no alliances. If we are also trying to arrange a marriage with a nearby ruler, you'll first want to select a close family member 
like my daughter here. And you'll see if I marry the Prince of France, then there will be an alliance. And that makes sense. Versus this is just their courtier. And that would not result in an alliance. It will also confirm on the next page when you do marry here. So in this example war, I'm going to attack the Kingdom of Alba for the Earldom of Mon. And I can call on my ally, Queen Lisa of Denmark, who's my mother. So once war has been started, in the current situation tab, you'll see if you can call on your allies. And you'll see that I'm going to spend 350 prestige to call on my ally. And in order to call them the war, it requires an acceptance score. So make sure your ally likes you. Sometimes you might have to bribe them with some gold to make them willing to join you. One tip to note is that you can call your allies even if you don't have enough prestige or if you even have negative prestige. So right now I'm at 69 prestige and spending 350 is going to put me into the negatives, but I can actually do that. And you see that she's going to join us anyways. And now I'm going to be at negative 276 prestige. Versus in a defensive war, you do not have to pay prestige to call your allies to war, but you still need to fulfill the acceptance score. Alliances will break automatically if requirements are not met, such as family members dying and therefore there's no blood bond. However, allies will remain in the current war even if the bond tying them is broken. We won't be able to call them for future wars, however. So in this example, I'm allied to the King of Aragon, and that's because of a marriage between Prince Philip and to Ermesenda. And you'll see he's an ally here in the war. However, if we were to do something like purposely trying to break that alliance through this murder, so even after I've killed off the family member tying the alliance, you can see that the alliance is broken. However, if you check the war, he's still here, and that's because once committed, they will always stay there until the war is over so you can use this to your advantage it also means that if i try to murder the enemy's allies it will not actually change whether or not that kingdom is in this war or not. So you can't get rid of enemy allies by murdering their rulers. The AI can also call you to wars, and if you decline a war, then you will lose fame and some opinion with that ruler, which means if you try to call on them in the future, they might not accept if they still dislike you. You can always accept the war and not send anyone, especially if you're busy fighting your own wars. Just note that if the war lasts longer than two years and you have zero contribution, then the allied ruler will lose 20 opinion and you may be asked to pay gold or prestige you can always send a single regiment to get contribution if needed when declaring war and previewing the allies make sure to check the enemy's family to see if they have any unmarried children or if they are unmarried themselves so if we check this king's children you'll see that they are all unmarried which means that once we declare this war there's a potential that he can make many alliances so if we declare the war and call on our own ally we may think that we are currently at the advantage and you can see we make a mistake because now he's made many powerful alliances and now his army is drastically larger you can see that all his children are now betrothed to someone so be careful of unmarried family members so that wraps up the general overview you should have a decent idea of warfare in crusader kings 3 this section is going to dive deeper into each different casas belli and give some general tips for how they apply to a game a claim Casus Belli, like used in the beginning of the video, is when you, a courtier or vassal, has a claim to another title. You can fabricate claims most easily by using your bishop on the fabricate claim task. Normally you get a county level claim, but sometimes you can get a duchy level claim. At the end of the fabrication, you'll get a notification to pay some gold to complete the job. Once you've paid for the claim, you can now see that there's the claim in your character page. And now you have a Casus Belli to declare war on your neighbor. You can see my claims here for chiefdom. So early game, it can be kind of slow because you can only get a claim for a lower level title. However, when you become a king, or especially so when you're an emperor, now you can press other people's duchy and kingdom level claims, which grabs bigger areas of land at a time. Because of your higher rank, if you win, they will become vassals under you. So in this example, I'm the emperor of Alba, and I have a courtier who has a claim on the kingdom of France. So Judith here, if I press her claim of France, you'll see that she becomes my vassal and will hold the kingdom of France. So once I've won this war, you'll see if I enforce the demand, 
Now Judith is my vassal, and you see that she holds the Kingdom of France, and my empire's lands are significantly increased. So in this way, you can use high-level claims to quickly conquer large areas of land. The Jurcasis Belli is unlocked through cultural innovation and increases in potency as the technology upgrades. It allows you to conquer the Jure pieces of land. So as the Empress of Francia, if we click on the Empire Title filter, these are the de Jure lands of Francia. So the lands that are currently owned by the Holy Roman Empire down here, de jure belong to me. In the tribal era of innovations, the Cassis Belli innovation unlocks the de jure county Cassis Belli and the de jure duchy Cassis Belli. In the high medieval era, there is divine right, which unlocks the de jure Cassis Belli. This is for all de jure lands and not just a county or duchy. It also unlocks some other nice things, including ability to press multiple claims for another character. If I declare a war against the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, you'll see I have access to the de jure county Cassis Belli, which can target any of the de jure counties that should rightfully belong to me as the Empress of Francia. The de jure duchy Cassis Belli will let me target any of these duchy size pieces. And then even better, unlocked with divine right, the seize all de jure lands Cassis Belli will take all of these de jure lands that should belong to the title of Francia. De jure is also nice because you don't have to use a claim and instead it's based on your title. If we look at the Aquitaine title, You'll see that it only requires 17 out of the 33 de jure counties to form this title. So in the early game, if you're able to form the kingdom by just conquering 17 pieces, then through the de jure Cassis Belli technology, you won't need to fabricate any more claims or look for claimants, and instead use the de jure county or de jure duchy Cassis Belli to continue your conquest for the rest of your realm. I'm the emperor of Alba here, and I also hold the... Kingdom of Denmark as a vassal, and the importance of de jure is that these two vassals want to destroy my primary title, and part of the reason is because I do not control my entire de jure area, so I have these two pieces that Francia still holds. Another faction of a vassal is primarily because he is outside of my de jure area, so since I'm not his rightful liege, he has this plus 155 commitment to this faction. If I was able to get the Scandinavia Empire title, then I would be his rightful liege, and he would not have that penalty there. So de jure is very important, and building an all de jure realm for yourself can be an easy way to maintain your power. A conquest or invasion Cassis Belli requires us to be a tribal government type, which is common in the 867 start, or our religion is unreformed, or we have the warmonger tenet or pursuit of power tenet. In this case, we have all three. We're tribal, unreformed, and warmonger. Essentially, this Cassis Belli gives me the ability to conquer up to a kingdom title based on the level of fame I have, to any neighboring counties, including over these sea tiles. You only get one kingdom invasion per lifetime, so use it smartly. So right now, I only have a claim inside my own realm. I have no claims on anything nearby. However, you'll see if I just click on this realm, I always have this conquer county Cassis Belli available to me at any point. Because we are both the same faith, you'll see it costs piety. And another example is if we come to small land here, you'll see if I declare war. I can also conquer any of these counties that border my lands. I could also conquer this entire duchy. However, you'll see it's not available right now because my level of fame is too low. So I'm currently at established and requires the illustrious level of fame. If my fame was high enough, I would be able to use this invade Cassis Belli. You'll see that it requires exalted among men level of fame. And if I win, then I would seize all the territory inside this kingdom title. And it tells you again here that you only have one per lifetime. So this conquest Cassis Belli is why starting in 867 might be a little more beginner friendly because you will always be able to go to war instead of having to slowly fabricate claims or wait for a claimant to come into your court. The subjugate Cassis Belli is available to tribal governments against other tribal governments, eastern religions to eastern religions, or temporal head of faith to a shared faith realm. So when you use the subjugate Cassis Belli, you take their primary title and you make them your vassal. You can also
also only perform one subjugation war per lifetime. So normally I would save the subjugate to try to grab the biggest piece you can. A holy war is a cast of spell eye that requires your faith to be organized and also not have the pacifism or dharmic pacifist tenet. To use the cast of spell eye, it must target an evil or hostile faith. So as a Catholic ruler, we view a sashru as evil. So if I try to declare war, so these holy war cast of spell eye are available. They are also tiered by level of devotion. So it requires a faithful level of devotion for a duchy holy war and a paragon of virtue level of devotion for a holy war for kingdom. You can also only attempt one holy war for kingdom per lifetime. The exception is if you have the by the sword cultural tradition, then you can have unlimited number of kingdom level holy wars. It will even require one less level of devotion. When you fight a holy war, a few things will be unique. If you do get to enforce your demands, you'll see that all titles held by that evil or hostile faith will be seized by you, versus any Catholic vassals will be transferred over to you. If you expand the arrow, you'll also see that it's going to cost some fervor. If you win, your faith's fervor will decrease, versus the enemy's fervor will increase. Another unique aspect is it'll warn you that other rulers of the same enemy faith can join their war even without a formal alliance. So just be mindful if you're using a holy war in an area that is heavily surrounded by the enemy faith. This is especially relevant if you're trying to attack a Catholic ruler. The last thing as well is the enemy's faith might have a lot of holy orders and they can suddenly turn the tides if they call upon a large holy order against your forces. So be careful of that. A great holy war, such as a crusade, is declared by the head of faith of a religion, such as the Pope, for a kingdom that is ruled by a hostile faith. The faith needs to have either warmonger, armed pilgrimages, or struggle and submission tenets. For Catholicism, it has armed pilgrimages. In addition to having one of those tenets to unlock a great holy war, the faith needs to have a head of faith that is not in prison. There are at least 35 counties following the faith. The fervor is above 65%, and it's been 10 years since another faith has unlocked great holy wars. The following table also lists some additional requirements. A real straightforward example is for the faith Catholicism, with no minimum year requirement. If at any point Rome is ruled by someone who is not Christian, then Catholicism will unlock great holy wars. For Islam, it has to wait until Catholicism has unlocked great holy wars, but as long as they fulfill the requirements, they can also unlock pretty soon thereafter. If you are playing your own custom faith, you would need to fulfill any of these last two conditions. So either any two holy sites are controlled by a different religion, or after both Christianity and Islam have unlocked great holy wars, and at least one holy site is of a hostile or evil faith ruler. Once you have unlocked great holy wars, they can either be directed or undirected. We'll first talk about directed great holy wars. Directed great holy wars are called by ten poral heads of faith, which means that the head of faith title is given to the founder and then passed on to their heirs, versus a spiritual head of faith, like the Catholic Pope, is given to a prominent clergy member and does not pass based on blood relations. As the temporal head of faith, I'm able to call crusades against enemy rulers who are of a hostile or evil religion, such as this Islamic neighbor here. So I can call for a crusade for any of his territories here. This requires 75% fervor, and we have 100% fervor right now. If we win this crusade, I as the head of faith will gain the title, and titles inside of this kingdom here will be divided among the participants' beneficiaries. The fervor of my faith will decrease by 25, and the enemy's fervor will increase by 30. As this is a great holy war, rulers on both sides can join this war at any point in time, meaning the military approximation here may not be very accurate, and instead you might want to check out your religion map to see which rulers are nearby of that faith. Once the crusade is called, we will get this notification. We will also be able to preview the crusade page over here. This page can show you who is on the attacker side and also who is on the defender side. Since we are the temporal head of faith, we don't need to select a beneficiary because it's ourself. And another big difference between a great holy war and a regular holy war is that there is no white piece option. There is a 50% cap to the attacker's war score for battles. There's the normal 150% occupied holdings for the war score. And even though we just captured the war leader of the enemy 
religion, you'll see we actually do not get any war score from prisoners. So the strategy for a great holy war is usually to win all the battles and siege down as many holdings as you can. Once we have won this crusade, I will gain the Kingdom of Valencia title. The Great Holy War will now be on a 30 year cooldown. An undirected Great Holy War is declared by a spiritual head of faith such as the Catholic Pope. The requirement for the war is the same and that the faith needs 75% fervor and it can only target a kingdom that is held by a hostile faith. There is a special preparation phase and you will get this notification to either pledge your military support or pledge some gold in exchange for piety you'll see there's something called a war chest so as people pledge either military support or gold then a war chest of prestige piety and gold will build up once you have picture selection you can also preview to see the exact size of the war chest down here you can also see again who is already pledged on either side and in this case we want to appoint a beneficiary usually it will be a family member who is not close in any success session line. So let's pick my dynasty member here. At any point I could replace the beneficiary. I could even select the beneficiary as the war is coming to a close. I can withdraw from this war. I can ask the Pope to redirect the war. So right now he is going for Zenzir. If you double click the title it will move you over to where that title is. If you don't like where that is, you can always redirect the war and you could pick from a list of kingdoms that are held by hostile faiths. I'm okay with this kingdom here, so I'll leave it alone. You can also continuously donate gold to get some more piety if you need that. One trick you could do is, before the crusade launches, you can preemptively raise your armies and send them to the target location. So I can start sending them over here close to where Zenzir is going to be. And so they're ready for the war in three months. And once the crusade is ready to start, you'll get this notification. And 20% of the war chest has been split to all the participants so we got a little bit of gold prestige and piety if the war ends in our victory then the military participants will split the remaining 80 percent with more of it going to the biggest contributor so because i'm already here you can see there's an enemy here i can already attack and you can use the war page down here to track your contribution and you want to make sure your contribution is as high as you can with most of it coming from battles and some of it coming from sieges you only get occupation score once you occupy the city and as time passes so it, it accrues the most slowly so no one is here but i'm already conquering the lands here and i've already gotten a lot of contribution for this siege and you can see it's only 10 per month so it's very little which is why the biggest contributions will be from battle and sieges so we have won the crusade and you'll see most of my score is from sieges and very little of it is from occupation I didn't get to participate in many battles this time around, but at least I'm still first place. Once the crusade ends, you'll see that if I am in first place, my dynasty member will now be the crusader king of this new crusader kingdom. You'll see that the rest of the war chest is divided, which is also listed down here. You see we got 20% of that share. Also, because I participated in the crusade and I was leading one of my armies, I gained the crusader trait. The new crusader king will also have a truce with all the involved hostile faith rulers, which helps him survive a little bit longer here. This is more relevant if his kingdom was in, say, Jerusalem. And only for undirected Great Holy Wars, you will get a notification that will say you can play as the ruler that you just helped install or you can focus on your own realm. Just be careful if you click on this, you cannot undo this decision and go back to playing the previous kingdom. In order to do that, you'll have to click switch character, which would invalidate your achievements. So if you're trying to do achievements, do not click play as that ruler. The independence war cast is Belli, as its name suggests, is when someone is trying to break free of vassalage. So I am Count Hans, I am a vassal of the King of France, and I always will have a Casus Belli to declare my own independence. Independence can be tricky because your liege can be much stronger than you. One tip you can do is in the faction section, there is a against your liege section and you can actually create an independence faction and we are the only member currently. However, we can also add other vassals and if we go down the intrigue tree and get the truth is relative perk, then we can have the fabricate hook scheme and this will allow us to fabricate hooks against other persons. So coming back here, I could right click this duke 
and I can fabricate a hook. You'll see it'll take some time here. At the same time, if I double click that duke, it will bring me to where his capital is located. I can also use my council member Spymaster in the find secret task. I can have him go into this duke's court. This way he will try to also look for any secrets that this duke might have. However, it's a random chance because the secret could be about another unrelated character. But this way you have two things going on at once. So this is one of the lucky times where I was able to fabricate a strong hook. You can see I have the option to fabricate a strong hook here. The other option is to restart it. I could come back to the faction here and I can finally add this member as he can be forced to join. And now it will be my military might along with his. You can try to slowly do this over time to collect more and more of the vassals and have them join against your liege. Another way to help with independence wars is obviously to go to war against your liege when he's already at war. If we try to declare war against him, you'll see that he also has many allies. And so one of the ways to weaken him is to murder your... So now these alliances might be broken because the marriages might not be related. Even better is you might have to murder a few times. So if we murder my liege and his heir, then it'll go to his grandson who's a four-year-old. So the realm can be very chaotic. You can again go down the intrigue tree and go for Skullduggery Focus for increased aging acceptance, for Swift Execution for more murder scheme power, and for a job done right which increases all hostile schemes which murders fall under. If you want to go even further, if you get the Schemer trick, that's another 25%. You can also marry a wife of a lot of intrigue and have her go onto Core Intrigue, and it gives 50% of her Intrigue, which in this case is a massive plus 14 bonus. So once I murder my Liege, you can check our new Liege, and you'll see that He's a little bit weaker, and some of those alliances are broken. And so if we murder our new liege, now his son is going to be our liege, and you can see his power has decreased even more. The next two castes spell I are unlocked with perks in the Diplomacy Tree. They are the Ducal Conquest perk and the Forced Vassalage perk. The Forced Vassalage perk forces someone of lower rank under you. Right now, I'm a duke of Munster, and nearby is an Earl, which is a Count rank, and you'll see I have Forced Vassalization cast as Belli. I could force him to become my vassal. And you can see I have this with almost every neighbor here, and so now I can force him to become my vassal, and now he's part of my realm. The other cast of Belli is called the Ducal Conquest of a County. This lets you conquer other pieces of a unformed duchy that you have a piece of already. So if I go to the duchy title area, You'll see that the Duchy of Leinster are these two counties here, and currently no one owns this title. So because I own one part of that duchy, I am now able to declare war to get the other piece of that duchy. And so if you use these two perks in Cassus Belli, you'll be able to circumvent the slow and steady process of using fabricate claims with your bishop, and you can quickly conquer nearby scattered counties. The only danger is that every time you vassalize someone, they will highly dislike you. So it can be a recipe for disaster as if you have enough of these forced vassals, they might try to murder you or rise against you. So exercise caution when using these two Casus Belli. The Varangian Adventure Casus Belli requires the Northern Lords DLC. It requires you to be either Norse or Estonian culture and is only accessible when you are in the tribal era of the innovation section. So mostly for 867 starts. You can only declare this Casus Belli if your rank is Count or Duke. It cannot be used if you're a King or higher. The flavor of this Casus Belli is that we as Norsemen or Estonians are seeking new lands to settle. So for example, I'm here in upland and I might have dreams of traveling to better climates like the kingdom of Alba. So when I declare war, I can have an adventure against the king of Alba. It will always be for a specific duchy. Pick one of the three duchies here. I'm going to pick this duchy since it's the bigger piece of his lands. The special thing is that I will be giving up all of my lands and any landed family members will receive my spare counties, and my, all my old titles will be destroyed or given independence. I do gain a good amount of gold. I also gain this nice adventurer trait. And if I come down here, you'll see I also get a special army of 2,000 men, and these are the adventurers that are going to come on my journey. You can see in the military tab that most of them are actually men-at-arms, which is very powerful. The amount of men you get will depend on how big your, your current realm is. My current realm is 12 counties large, which will give me the max 
maximum amount of 2,000 men. So you can always try to build up a realm of 10 counties before you go on an adventure. If you somehow unlock the Wanderlust Dynasty legacy, you will also get an additional 1,000 men. The AI can also use this Cassus Belli, although rarely. The adventurers will also be inherited on succession. If you lose the adventure war, then these special vikings will be disbanded however if you try another adventure you'll get a fresh stack of 2000 adventurers if you win the first adventure and try to go for a second one you do not get a fresh stack of soldiers even if all the adventurers die so make use of them wisely you still have your personal army as well so i have a big advantage against the kingdom of alba you'll see that once i enforce my demands i've now given up all these lands in upland and instead now i'm the new jarl of katanes i can also continue to go on adventures if i want to so let's say i don't like how cold it is up here i can go on an adventure against wessex and the prestige cost will increase increase over time. The same rules apply where I will give up all my old lands in order to take a new duchy title over here and I will also gain that amount of gold. So this Cassus Belli is very immersive It makes you feel like an adventurer and it also makes it so that a Norse or Estonian ruler can easily develop a strong force to take over any of these desirable parts of Europe. An excommunication war is a unique Cassus Belli to faiths with the communion tenet. For example, Catholicism. The head of faith, in this case the Pope, can excommunicate any rulers. If you right click your target ruler, you'll see a request excommunication interaction. Because the Pope likes me enough and the target ruler has two sinful traits of deceitful and gluttonous, the Pope will excommunicate King Bedwigin, which gives these penalties. Once he is excommunicated, I can now declare war on this heathen ruler and you'll see that this Cassus Belli is available here. If I am successful in this war, then it will depose this ruler, removing him from power and putting his heir onto his throne. So if you are Catholic and you dislike your neighboring ruler or you need a succession to happen, you can use excommunication to force it to happen. You can even fabricate hooks against the Pope so that you can use a hook to force him to accept a excommunication if needed. A trick to get more opinion from the Pope quickly is instead of swaying him which has a low chance and takes years I can always grant him titles from my own holdings and you'll see if I grant him the County of Mary I get a whopping 40 opinion already I can also grant him a vassal from my realm so I can give him this vassal over here I'll get another 40 opinion so I can excommunicate whoever I need. Another special perk Cassus Belli is with the Accomplished Forger perk. This will let you buy a claim on an artifact. For example, my neighbor, the Byzantine Emperor, has some nice artifacts, so I can right click him to buy an artifact claim. We can select the artifact that I want to buy a claim on through here. I'm going to go for this crown and use my prestige to buy the claim. And now that I have the claim, I could declare war against him for this artifact claim. If I'm successful then I will take the artifact from him. The next special wars is if you have the human sacrifice tenant then you can raid for captives against your neighbors. So as this tiny tribal chieftain here I can go attack my neighbor and I can raid him for captives. If I am successful then I will get three to five courtiers and some prestige as well. So once I win this war I will now get some prisoners and you can see I have these four prisoners here and now I can freely sacrifice them to my gods. Sometimes if they have money, you can also ransom them for some gold. And that's everything I think you need to know about Warfare in Crusader Kings 3. Now you just need some playthroughs to get the practice needed to become a god of war. If this video has helped you, please consider subscribing and liking this video. It helps me tremendously, so thank you very much. You can check out my channel for other guides and leave a comment if you have any questions or want to see a specific topic discussed. Thanks again from Bread God and have a good day.